the Executive Director of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center Foundation, and I welcome you to our program this evening. We are honored once again to host award-winning author Joyce Carol Oates, and tonight celebrate Danielle Evans, this year's recipient of the Joyce Carol Oates Prize. It's now my pleasure to introduce Joe DePrisco, new literary project founder, author, editor, and a moderator for this evening. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. It's uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Beth. It's been a sweet journey uh, as we founded the uh, the literary project starting six years ago. Uh, once upon a time, we were the we we're proud to be the Simpson Literary Project. Now we are the new literary project. We invest in teachers, students, authors, and we inspire and equip writers across generations to write their hearts out. We teach, we publish, we support. Please take a look at our brand new website. Uh, welcome here, Cinco de Mayo, to meet Joyce Carol Oates and Danielle Evans. Uh, the Zoom universe can take its toll, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, it won't be long before somebody like me is telling you to turn your, your cell phones off and where the bathrooms are. That'll happen soon enough. As for housekeeping, our marvelous uh, executive director, Diane Del Signore, will be managing the Q&A, which we encourage you to use. And Ashley uh, Patterson Scott, our wonderful digital director, is managing the chat. Uh, and, and use gallery view for the best video. OK. I think that's all the housekeeping. So let me begin. Uh, Danielle Evans is the much celebrated and be laureled short story writer who meteorically burst on the scene over a decade ago. She's a professor at Johns Hopkins. And to bring us to now, she is the 2021 recipient of the Joyce Carol Oates Prize, $50,000 awarded by the New Literary Project for a distinguished mid-career author that is someone who is emerged and still emerging. She will be with us periodically throughout the year and be in brief residency at Cal in the spring, working closely with our colleagues at the Berkeley English Department. Her most recent book is The Office of Historical Corrections, published by Riverhead, edited by Sarah McGrath. Ladies and gentlemen, we're honored to be with Danielle Evans tonight. And there you are, Danielle. Okay, Joyce Carol Oates is Joyce Carol Oates. She is the world famous author of many, many, many important books of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and memoir. Beloved by generations of readers, writers, and students the world over, the recipient of all the major literary awards. Her recent books include American Melancholy, her latest book of poems, Night, Sleep, Death, and the Stars, a monumental family saga of staggering impact, and The Other You, her latest book of short stories published by Echo, edited by Dan Halpern. To bring us to this moment, she is the inspiration and a dear friend of the New Literary Project. Ladies and gentlemen, we're honored to be here with Joyce Carol Oates. Joyce, there you are. So, uh, where am I? Sarah? I can't see. I don't know. Joyce is in two windows here. Not that we mind that Joyce. Great to see you in two windows. Um, okay. Let's try this speaker view. Nope. Start my video. Oh, there you go. Oh, I don't know what happened. Sorry. Apologies. All right. Uh, so I, I want to, I hope we can get to talk about a lot of stuff uh, today. Why is my video going off? There it is. Uh, I want to talk about uh, your books, your most recent books. Uh, I want to talk about the art of the short story and the public issues that animate your imagination, I hope. And I also hope this will be a three-way conversation where you'll be able to engage each other on questions that interest you. But let's begin with a subject nobody is talking about, punctuation. So Joyce's latest book of short stories is The parentheses, other, close parentheses, you. 
And I just can't resist asking about that and thinking about Joyce. When I see the parentheses, uh, it has multiple functions in your writing. It can be impish, it can be ironic, it can be funny, it can be uh, a warning. I'm, I'm, so I guess I'm, my general question is, what, are the, what about punctuation interests you? What's, what punctuation don't you like? What punctuation do you do you fight with your copy editor about ellipsis, uh, exclamation point, brackets? I mean, what some of there? That's the question. Well, it's an interesting question, sort of a metaphysical question. I must say, no one's ever asked me that before, and probably no one has asked Danielle that. <laughs> well, in this particular collection of stories, I'm really working on the idea of uh, what is reality. What exactly is this world that we're living in? You know, I think we've suffered a kind of ontological upheaval in the past year or so, almost not knowing who we are. I know my own, in my own life, I've done a lot of thinking. I've been so much in solitude with just two therapy animals. Yeah. So you sort of look back upon your life and think of ways that you might have gone, sort of alternate lives or alternate universes. So. The other you is a way of thinking of there may be other yous somewhere out in, in the world that you didn't realize, or there may be an other you inside yourself. So I'm using the, the parenthesis to suggest that. And when we're speaking in an ordinarily, we don't have any way of indicating bra you know, brackets or parentheses. Sometimes I will say, well, parenthetically, it'll make a little gesture like this. We're, we're sort of on one plateau, but the kind of writing that that I do in this in this book is not necessarily the sort of writing that I do all the time. This is more like a, an inquiry into the nature of, of reality. And I was looking at Danielle, I mean, looking again at Danielle's wonderful collection of, of stories and She's, she has a kind of interesting structure for her stories. I'm not noticing any unusual punctuation, but it's something <laughs> that I have sometimes done myself. There's a foreground story that's moving along at a certain momentum, but then there's a backstory, kind of something in the background that's making possible the foreground story. So I noticed that Daniel did that. This is a maybe a more traditional structure for the short story. It's not minimalism. No. You don't get that structure in Hemingway, but you would get that structure in Alice Munro or, or maybe in Chekhov. So I do think about these things in terms of how to best present the work that I'm trying to tell. And, and Alice Munro is, is, is an, a writer you've called out a few times. I'm gonna, I'll follow up later with my punctuation questions about, because I know you're fond of the M-dash and I didn't see a single parenthesis in my scientific uh, research into your, your book. So would you, would you like to respond to what uh, Joyce had to say? Sure, I was gonna say, I'm a little afraid of answering questions about punctuation because the angriest anyone's ever been, a, been at me on social media was when I, I made a joke about ellipses and punctuation Twitter got very mad. Seriously, I had to block like several people. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, don't, I don't think I tend to use parentheses, but I do, like, I do like a good interruption. And I think I do like an M dash. I also like the semicolon, I think. Oh my goodness, okay, here we go. I, I think maybe because it relates to something about what Joyce is saying, which is that I do like stories that sort of push together things that don't seem like they're the same story until, until they are. And I think that punctuation that allows for interruption or punctuation that allows for kind of pushing together two ideas maybe echoes that in some way. But I'm interested in structure in which sort of a story introduces it self to you as one thing and turns out to be something else. Daniel, have you experimented with writing very minimalist work? You know, I've tried. I was so proud of myself in this book because I finally got two stories that were below 10 pages. And then as I was turning the, the manuscript into a collection, I cut one of them because it just didn't belong and I wasn't interested in making it longer. I cut the shortest one. And then the second shortest story, I was like, 
I brought it to my editor and I was like, look, it's, it's below 10,000 words. I've done it. And she was like, but it, it could be longer. And I was like, you know what? You're right. It, it could be longer. And so it got longer. And I think better as it got longer. I think I'd sort of written around some things in the earlier version of it. But um, no, I'm not. I'm not a minimalist. <laughs> I was very struck by how you took a story that might have been written by someone else as a minimalist story that was just satirical. Boys go to Jupiter. That's naturally a sort of satirical one level story, but you don't, you're not content with that. You really take us back some years and you're grounding your character in a, in a very emotional um, reality that makes it impossible for us to dismiss her. You know, as we might if we knew about this girl uh, just to explain the story a little bit, it's very bold and audacious, especially as it begins before we know the depth of her personality. A girl who is not thinking too much, she's, she's really careless and she's not necessarily a racist at all, but she's wearing a bikini with a Confederate flag on it. This gets on social media and it goes viral. Instead of apologizing for this really crude iconography, if you can call it that, or at least retreating in embarrassed silence. She sort of doubles down and, and keeps doing it so that the reader is, is kind of wincing and, and squirming. And you're thinking, how can she keep doing this? But then we learn that there's a, a backstory to, to her life and that she was once, uh, she had her, her best friend was a black girl named, I think it was Angela that they loved each other and they had a, not exactly a falling up, but they went in different directions. So that's what I mean by it being kind of audacious and in, in a way really unexpected depth to the work. That's not minimalist. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I was interested in in this collection, and I think that story is a clear example of it, is when a character doesn't know what story they're in. So I think <laughs> More so than in my first book, I was writing, I think in my first book, I was really interested in the first person where at least the person in the story, the protagonist of the story thinks they know what's, what the story is. Whereas in this book, I was, I was trying to write characters who didn't necessarily see their own story or see themselves very clearly, which is sometimes trickier because you have to run what, what feels like the story to the character on the surface. And then this other story that lets you kind of see around the point of view. And that's a kind of, um, requires a kind of excavation. So I think both because of grief and because of privilege, this is a person who can't really see herself clearly. And so the whole story, even though it does move through time is in the present tense because it felt like the best way to capture um, a person who, who both can't move forward and can't hold herself accountable. And so there's this kind of freezing that happens but also allows hopefully everything to come into the story in, in waves. And I think that 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 discomfort was really important because I felt like if it had been too easy to dismiss her, there'd be nothing to wrestle with. I think that part of part of the question of the whole book really is, is about empathy. And I don't mean that in a flat way. I mean, I think sometimes we think of empathy as an all-purpose salvation or curative, but, but empathy costs things, right? And empathy can replicate power dynamics the same way anything else can. And so part of what I'm wrestling with here is how do we, live in a world where we both understand that people are better than the worst thing they've done and also understand that it it costs something to create space for people who've done harm to keep doing it and so um you know it's not a question i have an answer for which is why i have a bunch of stories trying to work through it what's the very antithesis of say social media or sound bites where everything is reduced to just one little you know tone or statement you're, you're writing works of art in which there's complexity and ambiguity. So the ending of Boys Go to Jupiter, the ending is really beautifully irresolute. So we don't even know what's going to happen next. And yet there's, a, there's a, a, an undercurrent or an overcurrent uh, throughout your book, Danielle, of, 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 I don't want to call it a dream or a wish, but a desire for redemption for resolving the truth, for uh, second chances, for the virtues that uh, we don't know we have. 
and what's I think the remarkable achievement is that uh, it doesn't come across as sentimental at all. It's very hard. It's edged, and it's uh, and it's big-hearted at the same time. Thank you. So I don't want to make a link, force a link between these two books, but it seems to me that one of the things that is, there's a great moment, Joyce, in The Happy Place, when the, the, the professor who has been uh, mystified by a student, Anna, and finds out that everything she thought about her uh, turns out not to be the case. And I mean, everybody who's ever taught for any length of time has had this experience with a student where you just mystify it. Okay, this is somebody I didn't understand. And she reaches this moment and it's so moving. And I've thought about this a million times. And she asks herself, what else has eluded you? And what else, and about what else have you been mistaken? And that's that, I mean, there's such emotion in that, uh, which is a theme throughout the entire other you. Um, and I think that this is, this is also going on in, in Danielle's uh, book of stories where where characters are uh, they are mysteries to themselves and they're multiple selves I, mean, I don't want to push this too much but there's there's a multiplicity of selves in in the in the multiracial characters who are there who are they're multiple selves they're negotiating uh, the the pressures of, of being uh, multiracial so they're and and, you, and this comes up a lot in in your book. Can I ask a question, Danielle? Please. Uh, I noticed that you have really really lovely tender relationships between women. It could be a mother and a daughter. It could be two friends, or it could even be with a nemesis, as in the uh, title novella. And I, I was just curious what the evolution of the Office of Historical Corrections was, whether that began as a short story and then it got longer, whether you always had Genevieve in it or did you add her a little later? Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's funny because I think there are two opposite and equally true answers to that question. So maybe I'll give you both. I mean, I will say generally, I think I'm really interested in friendship and I'm and I'm really interested in friendship in the short story because I think so much of classic short story structure for me is about it's about rhyming action and what it tells you about what's changed and what hasn't. And I think friendship lends itself to rhyming action because like when we talk a lot about novels and the marriage plot and, and that marriage is kind of an event, right? Either it happens or it doesn't and then it takes an event to undo it in some way. And I um, and not to say that there aren't lots of great short stories that are also about marriage, but I think Friendship is interesting to me because it's a choice you have to make over and over again, and it doesn't require an event necessarily to change your friendship. And so there's a way in which it allows you to kind of illustrate the past passage of time or a change in a person in a compressed space because it doesn't require drama for a friendship to shift. It just requires at least one person in the friendship to be slightly different than they were. And I think there's something interesting about just those sort of small intimate interactions and what they can convey about what's changed and what hasn't over time. Um, but the title story actually s sort of started as a novel. Um, I was working on a novel about a historian for years and years and it had sort of run into a variety of problems, one of which was just a time problem and so at a certain point it became unsolvable um, because it was, I'd sort of set it in the wrong time. I'd set it in the soon to be, at the, when I started writing it, it was set in the future and then it had become the past while I was writing it. And so it was set in this re alternate recent past that just didn't work. And I tried and I tried and it, it, it couldn't be saved. Um, and so I sort of abandoned that, I thought. And I was like, I'm gonna write a different novel. And I think I, I didn't realize, honestly, because I think a lot of being a writer is just being less smart than your subconscious. So I didn't realize that what I had done was just actually solve the other problem of the novel, which is that I'd given my historian an active job because I think the other sort of question of the novel was that everyone was like, why is this book centered on this person who's writing a book when all this other interesting stuff happens? And I was like, because that's the, the interesting character and nobody believed me. Um, so I found a way to make her interesting by kind of turning her, um, her work as a historian also into a kind of um, detective story that could, that could hold the plot. Um, yes, but, 
So yeah, so when I started it over, Genevieve was always in the story, but I don't think I'd, eventually I realized that I was writing about the same character that I had from the other novel. And so I brought her in. So in some ways, Genevieve was in the story before Cassie was, because before I sort of fully formulated who the main character was, I knew she had this rival slash friend. And I knew that that was part of the sort of the way that I would explain the arc of her life and her career. Um, but I think I only belatedly realized that I'd already kind of written this character and could pull in a lot of the character work I had done in the otherwise abandoned novel. Well, you really need both of them because Jeannie or Genevieve, as she becomes, uh, she is really the, the person who does the things that Cassie isn't going to do. Cassie is just more temperate. She's, she's more reasonable. She's maybe more like, more like us, more like the writer. And Genevieve is this character who's willing to put her life on the line. And the, the novella really has to be read, I think, a couple of times. It's, it's Kafka-esque, but it, but it also reminded me of Ralph Ellison. It has allegorical uh, dimensions to it, but at the same time, it's very realistic. And there's a lot of detail that's just um, sociological and very realistic. So I thought that was a beautiful, beautiful kind of equilibrium. But with Genevieve, we, with Genevieve is an interesting uh, sort of dramatic character as like a Shakespearean character where she, maybe she's going too far. You know, maybe you shouldn't be trying to correct everybody. Uh, we need to correct egregious errors and, and lies and falsehoods, but maybe at some point it's too much? Were you sort of thinking along those lines of moving toward tragedy? Yeah, I mean, I think I was interested in, in the fact that they have these completely different strategies. And in some ways, both of those strategies are doomed. You know, I think that oh, there really? isn't a way to be a person in an institution when you don't have the power to actually be the institution, I think is part of, and I think that this, that's, that's a sort of larger question, right, is that how do you balance wanting to be a person who does the right thing or makes changes in a structure that doesn't want to change or in a structure where you don't have the power to, to do the good that you want to do. And so I think having these characters represent kind of different, different versions of trying to navigate that, like a person who is more acquiescent and kind of tries to work inside the system and somebody who is more kind of competitive and, and willing to, to kind of burn things down. Um, in the end, neither of those exactly works, right? There's a price to both of those things. And I think that that's, that's again, part of, part of what I'm thinking about. And again, not coming to a, if I had, if I had a, an answer, there would be instructions in the book, but it is, is about power, right? Is, we all learn different ways to kind of navigate the power we don't have and the power that we do. And so I think in some ways th there is a tragedy in that both of these characters are unsure how to navigate the power that they don't have and it puts them at odds in a way that they're not able um, to save each other. But look what you did in Alcatraz with the, those terms exactly apply to what's going on where um, She's, the, Cecilia is trying to, well, how would you characterize that story? Where did that story come from? Where did you get to in that story you think that's different from uh, Office? Well, you know, it's funny because I insisted for years that that story had a happy ending. And so I remember when we were talking about, and because that's the oldest story in the book, just in terms of time, it's the one that I wrote earliest. And so some of the stories were pretty much done when the collection was ready to go and others, that were either very old or very new. Um, I wanted to, to edit for the collection, and so I remember talking to to my to my editor and her assistant, and um, having this. I said, "Well, you know, I don't. I'm afraid of changing that story too much because it's really the only story that has a happy ending." And my editor's assistant just very gently kind of looked at me and was like, "Do you think that that story is happy?" <laughs> and I think I looked at it again and I was like, "Okay, I guess it wasn't that happy in the first place. So I have some room to open it back up." And um, and yeah, I mean, I think again, it's a sort of, it's a lack of, it's a lack of resolution, right? It's not, 
it's not a dramatic tragedy and that there is some tentative reconciliation, but it's not, um, it's not enough and it's not enough to kind of overcome this larger gap of, of kind of many years and of different experiences and different senses of what the world is. And so um, I think the other, other reason it was hard to edit that story is that it did come more than most of my work from some actual family history, although very, very heavily fictionalized. Um, and so the other reason I had trouble editing that story was because it's the only story that I've ever given anyone permission to sign off on. And so I, I, I thought, well, if I gave it to my mother as a happy story and she liked it that way, I can't, I can't make it sadder. And it had to be pointed out to me that it was kind of sad all along. <laughs> so well, it's, very, it's very touching and it's very yes. tragic. Right. And, and we can't say that this is fiction at all. I mean, this is so, so timely and sort of staring us in the face. And, you know, as a writer, I'm all, if I, I, like most of us, if you work on something, it often doesn't get published to, you know, two or three or four years after you're writing it. So I'm very often asked if I was influenced by something that happened like a couple of months ago, but you can see in your work, um, one of the climactic scenes in, in the book takes place in a place called Cherry Mill, Wisconsin, which is just like an hour's drive away from Min from Minneapolis. So when people who read this book like in a year from now, they may think that there is some direct historical connection there, but your writing is so prescient. Well, there's a Cassandra everywhere in your in your book, right? <laughs> and the idea of alternate facts. Yeah. You don't you Daniel doesn't use that phrase alternate facts, which we find so infuriating. Right. But all around, you know, these plaques and historical monuments and textbooks, especially, all this misinformation that's out there. And to try to correct it would be a whole lifetime. So it's Sisyphean labor, you, but but the young the young woman, Cassie, she has that kind of, uh, that sense of mission and especially G Genevieve does. Well, there's, there's an interesting thing that you said, Danielle, in, um, in an interview, I think it was an L. You said, for, for years, I felt like I was being told to resist my most catastrophizing impulses, only to have many of them turn out to be right. Mm. And the, the link I would make to Joyce's story, great story, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, uh, Luce, the, the, the wife, uh, her husband mansplains to her all the time, don't catastrophize. While the world is going to hell, all around them, he's saying, women, don't catastrophize. Yeah. Women, <laughs> are, women are always told that. Women are told they're too emotional. We just have to be very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the tone of Danielle's writing is so reasonable. I mean, there's just this wonderful reason. I was almost a little startled a minute ago, Danielle, when you said that that there wouldn't be, you, d you didn't have faith in institutions because I, I've ne almost never encountered anyone writing about the government, like the federal government, yeah. in a way that you do, that this is, is hopeful. It's, it's so well presented in the prose. And then I learned something also that I didn't think about or just didn't know about, that when, say, the right wing takes away money from the, the government, sort of demonizing the government, that's taking away employment and, and identity and lives of, of those people who, are, who work for the government as, as civil servants. And they keep the whole government and the country, the economy going. So to take away their jobs is really an ultimate ra racist strategy that I, I probably didn't even think about. And it didn't occur to me. Yeah, and I mean, I think that I, I don't, I think that for years, I, I grew up in DC and, and outside of DC and I think I didn't, I didn't think of DC as being a place that I, the, the place, I, didn't, I don't think I fully understood how much my sense of the government was part of my understanding of DC as a place until I lived away from it for years. And the way that people in other places talked about the federal government felt so foreign to me because to me, those were, you know, those were people's 
parents' jobs. That was that was sort of where you went to work. And it was, you know, and some people had, you know, policy jobs, but some people were, you know, secretaries or drivers. I mean, things that are now all privatized used to be, those used to be government jobs. Like the person who would pick up the boss in the car was a government employee and had like good retirement benefits. And that's all gone now. Um, and so I think that there is a complicated relationship I have you know, I have a, a healthy distrust of institutions and also a deep amount of respect for people who believe that they can be better and work the way that they're intended. And so, um, again, that is another thing I sort of failed to reconcile in various ways in this in this collection. But I'm, you know, um, I want to believe in possibility, and I also think that there are a great many reasons for cynicism and anxiety. I thought that was beautifully expressed. And also, as I said, I think it's, it's news to many people. Of course, we, we all sort of flinch and we, we cringe when we're told that the government is evil and Ronald Reagan says that, that the government is the worst, you know, the, our enemy. I mean, that just seems so sinister. But then to see how it would affect very nice, hardworking, decent, good citizens that they become somehow demonized with this government. I thought that was very well expressed and I don't think many people write about that. No, and I mean, I think that's, that was sort of part of, it was a tricky thing to find a way to write about. I think part of what, what failed in the, the novel that preceded that novella was that I was trying to write about DC as a government city, but it's hard to write about uh, government as a structure without writing about specific politics and politicians, which I wasn't interested in. Yeah. And so at the same time, because I do think we live in a world that is influenced by who's in office and what a particular administration does, it also felt flat to kind of invent a presidency or invent fake politicians. <laughs> and so I had to just sort of get away from that higher level of power and bring it down to the level of like who works at these agencies, because that actually is a more constant reality, I think, than than a particular and, and is a question that's bigger than a particular administration or a particular election um and that i hope was how i solved that problem to to, to, to be able to write about the thing that i really am interested in um well may, may i read some of this prose i thought was so beautiful this is from the office of historical corrections i was a child of two federal employees raised in a city where integrated Fredward Jobs had crucially sustained the black middle class. The most bewildering part of leaving DC the first time was discovering that elsewhere, people casually used the term federal government as a pejorative. I needed no convincing of the fatal possibilities of government overreach, the way fat fatalities told the story of who the nation considered expendable. But even after the low points of the previous decade, I believed in government or at least believed in it more than the alternative, that my country might always expect me to audition for my life. I accepted as fact, but I trusted the public charter of national government more than I trusted average white citizens acting unchecked. No, I thought that was beautiful. And there's such a tragic line that I would have expected to audition for my life. Really remarkable. Thank you. So what's the fine line, would you say, between catastrophizing and sounding the alarm? I mean, what's <laughs> the, what is, because um, I think both of your books of short stories uh, register a great deal of urgency about the, the vanishment, the, uh, uh, the evanescence of life um, and the risks of, of everyday life. And uh, what's what's fascinating is you both of you do these uh, um, uh, these utterly domestic scenes that are completely supercharged with political and and moral issues. So it's never just a, a domestic uh, incident. One of the things I really loved about and and loved and was impressed in a terrifying way by about Teresa's most recent book was that. I think I haven't even figured out how to write about the climate yet because, because it scares me so much that when I think about it too hard, I just stop believing in the future and I can't get to the place where the work is. And I really admired how many of your stories had this sort of looming 
climate crisis that we were going to sort of learn to live through even as it killed us and I thought it was it was beautifully done because it it felt realistic even though it required some imagining and and kind of done in this way that um that didn't take away from the emotional or human dynamics of the stories and I haven't figured out how to do that just a reminder that, that, that Diane is uh, will be taking your questions in the Q and A. You see the box at the bottom. Please uh, jump in with the, your good questions. Yeah, ominousness. Uh, there's you're good at that, Joyce. Did anybody ever tell you that? It's, <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a wonderful sort of. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a cloud, both a literal cloud and a metaphysical cloud that uh, just drifts across all these stories. They're so marvelous. Uh, I mean, I love the fact that you even take the little joke that the stories take place in Uville, Y-E-W-ville. Uh, I thought that was charming. Um, and then you have a writer who's, um, who is, uh, who might have been, and a writer who was and you know, gets confronted by the mean girls when she comes back into town. I mean, I wonder if either you or Danielle can talk about what it means to to have to become a writer in your in your world. What's it like to to find yourself uh, seen by others as, oh wait, you're the oracle, you're the person uh, who knows stuff. Danielle's stories often do go very fluently back and forth between times so that her Cassie and Jeannie have this relationship and Genevieve is like a, a later manifestation, but she can sort of remember when they were just girls together and they, and they were quite different. So there's this feeling that, the, that there's always some depth and background to Daniel's writing. If we see somebody you're still walking in the street, we just see the person in present time. But one of the wonderful things about narrative fiction and particularly the sort of Chekhovian work that Daniel is doing is that you see the person in present time, but you also see the person in a context. So that's very consciously done. Danielle, did you want to say something about that? You look like you were going to. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was thinking, thank you. Um, you seem saying such lovely things about my work, and I just I feel overclumped and I don't know what to respond. But um, so I am. Um, I. Um, yeah, I do. I, I think it's interesting because I think that there's a there's a kind of story that's about choices, and I've written that kind of story. And then maybe some of the in, in the recent book are still that kind of story, right? Where the action of the story is about the choice that you did make. And then I think there's a kind of story that's about waking up one morning and realize you made a choice you didn't intend to. And that I think is more the psychological space of this collection. And so it does require some sense of both who you are and, and who you thought you might be or who you were in, in a previous space. And so I always, I should just write this line somewhere like right next to my computer because I'm always trying to quote it and I always mess it up. But there's a beautiful Alice Monroe line that says something like, they were all in their early 30s, the age at which you start to realize that what you are living is, your, is in fact your life, right? And so she writes it, it's, it's better, it's a better sentence than I just quoted. Mm. There's another word in there somewhere that I missed. Daniel, but, um, Daniel, do you want to talk a little bit about influences in your writing, people whose writing you really love? I'm sure. I think in terms of the, the short story, I, I do love Alice Monroe. I think that, I think that in some ways, because I don't think we're, even though there's all kinds of short fiction, I don't think we're in a particularly minimalist era. And I think that we are in some ways all living in Alice Monroe's era of the story right now, um, just in terms of what I see even my students doing. Um, also Edward P. Jones, who I think is a genius with time, who yeah. also can just sort of move through time or just give you this much, like, like half a sentence of the future, or half a sentence of backstory that somehow unsettles everything else in the story. And I don't even entirely know how he does it. Um, I think um, beyond the short story, I've I taught this semester my two favorite novels of, of all time, um, Toni Morrison's Jazz and uh, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. And I think you know what I love about both of those books is that they are 
so focused on both the collective experience and the individual experience, right? That without sort of sacrificing either the individual human experience to the sort of bigger question of what it means to live in a society or a community or a country, or kind of focusing on, on the small scale at the expense of the bigger questions. I don't know, it, everything is sort of there all at once. And um, I don't know, I think they're perfect novels and someday. <laughs> Well, also, there are very perfect works of style, very individual, idiosyncratic styles, vision. Nobody else could have written those, those novels. Diane, do you want to jump in with any questions that might have uh, surfaced? I do. OK, I have a question here. I have several. So. Have either of you ever considered writing a short story as a poem? Yeah, what is the difference between a poem and a short story? <laughs> well, I certainly have written poems that are narratives. <laughs> there is such a thing as narrative poetry. There's lyric poetry and there are dramatic monologues and then there's narrative poetry. I certainly, I mean, I don't know about Dan Danielle, but. It's not that I haven't written a poem of any kind in many, many years, and I think the world of poetry is better for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I think I realized that I was not a poet because I'd write a poem and I'd feel better. I'd feel like oh, I'm done with that thought. And I would write fiction and I'd feel unsettled and never want to let it go. And that seemed like a good sign that that was actually the thing that I cared about. Um, but I do think I do think there's a there's a Somewhere in the Venn diagram, there's a there's a territory where short stories and poems overlap. Where there are things where I don't know if I'd call it a prose poem or a piece of flash fiction. Um, I just not being a minimalist enough writer to do that tend not to find myself in that part of the Venn diagram. We have a question about. Ooh, uh, what does it mean? This is, oh gosh, this is probably to Joe. Possibly, what does it mean to be an emer and a writer who has already emerged and is still emerging. That's how we talk about the Joyce Carol Oates Prize. So Joe, do you want to give our well, elevator well, to that? Well, well, quickly, it just means uh, an author who has written several books, mid-career author. There are all kinds of emerging artists' uh, prizes. It's, all, it's very loosely defined, but for us, we have some ideas about what would constitute uh, a mid-career author. and. Uh, Danielle and, and Layla and Tony and Daniel and uh, Geronimo uh, uh, fit the bill perfectly as far as we're concerned. So um, it's, it's probably a little too cheeky to put it that way. I won't say it again. Okay, so back to Danielle and Joyce. I'd like to hear from both of you on this one. Uh, when you begin a story, does it begin with character, idea, voice, incident? Basically, is there an inciting kind of impulse? Oof, that's a big essay question, sounds like. <laughs> you mean uh, incident versus idea? Is that what the question's at? Well, I think what the question is saying is when the writer starts a story, is that they have a character in mind, an idea? A particular incident that the person wants to blow up. I'm interpreting from what I'm seeing here. I yes, I the answer is yes. Question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I usually start with a with a sense that I somehow two things that are not connected feel connected to me, and I have to figure out how they're connected. Well, your story Alcatraz would seem to be a story that might have been stimulated by something that actually happened, a terrible uh, act of injustice, terrible, ruining a young man's life, a young black man's life, basically. And then later on, he's, he's released from Alcatraz, but his, his life has gone by. And how do you present that? You know, that in other words, it may be something that actually happened, but that's not the story. The story will be how is it experienced by people in his family, especially. So yeah, there are, there are two ruptures in that story. The grandfather in that story is actually white, but then his, his granddaughter who he raises is black. And 
So the first rupture is this is this unjust imprisonment that happens to him when he's a very young man. And the second rupture is a rupture in the family that's caused by him having a black grandchild in the in the 50s when like people shun the family for that. And so um and then and then all of that is in the past of the story. So there's the actual present timeline is happening much later. And that that haunting I think was part of the story for me. Um, not to say that in any directly causal way, these things are related, but all of these things are kind of part of this family's history that has to be reckoned with. And so part of the, the challenge for the, the character at the center of the story, who's much younger, who's sort of born after all of this happens, is, is kind of what needs to be reckoned with and confronted and what needs to be let go of, like what, what it's not her job to solve or fix or hold on to. Um, and so the, the present action of the story is caused by her trying to kind of fix something and creating this dramatic event that causes them to sort of look at all this other stuff. Um, but it's really a daughter dealing with a mother. It's, it's a daughter dealing with a mother in a very realistic way. That's sort of yeah. at the forefront. Yeah. And she's 24, which I think is, is, is an important distinction here. What else you got, Diane? Well, I have a whimsical question here. Danielle and Joyce, you both love your cats. Uh, how, <laughs> how do they figure into your creative life? Sure. Um, the cat has heard that she was going to be on screen. So here's <laughs> Betty. She's come. Do you like to answer the question? She would not. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I've never written a story with a cat in it. I think. Oh my gosh. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, I have, and you should do it too. Just <laughs> I mean, I made cats almost like the very center of a novel. That's pretty daring. I will try someday. Right. <laughs> there was a scene, I wrote a scene with cats once in a short story, but it, it got cut. It was, <laughs> it was a woman trying to take this cat on a plane, but then I felt like there was a more efficient way to explain all the things I was trying to explain about this woman's life that the cat in the airport scene wasn't necessary. <laughs> All okay. right. I think, yeah. Let me just scan here through the Q&A if there's anything. Oh, I think well, there's another one. Oh, it says here. What was the title of the Toni Morrison book Danielle loves? Jazz. Although, I mean, there's more than one. But my, fa there's one, but the, my favorite is jazz. Okay. You must like the bluest eye very much. I do. Oh. I, I taught that, in fact, last semester. I taught jazz this semester, but last semester I taught a class on passing narratives. The Blue isn't really a passing narrative, but it was adjacent enough that it seemed interesting to talk about yeah. in no, conversation. That's a, that's a very special novel. And of course, Tony wrote it when she was maybe four, over 40 years old. And Tony was my friend and, and colleague at Princeton for, for quite a while. And I remember Tony saying that when, when she wrote the novel, there was a certain scene in it or some element in it that she, she wasn't quite ready to, to write up at that time. So later on, maybe 20 years later or so, she rewrote part of the novel, which I thought was so interesting. Yeah, no, I always, I, I think her introduction to that book is so interesting and fraught because it's, because she wrote it much later and, you know, it was an early book. And then so she, write, she wrote the introduction to The Bluest Eye herself from, from a distance. And there's something really interesting about her own assessment. Even though I think she's a little hard on herself, I think it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant achievement. And I think she's sort of looking at it um, with that sort of question of what she would have done differently. But it's a, it's a really beautiful introduction. And I think an interesting way of thinking about the fact that work is always in flux. You're, you know, a writer's relationship to their own project is always in flux. Well, Tony was a very unusual person. She had a kind of scalpel mind she was not predictable. Tony might just say something that, that would be startling, but it'd be very incisive. And when I knew her, she was also one of the funniest people I've ever met. You know, funny, just in, like at dinner, just telling stories and enormously funny. And not, not all of that, not too much of that gets in the novels, actually, this kind of jovial, whimsical, sometimes a little bit naughty or mischievous sense of humor that she had, very playful. I think maybe 
jazz might part of why I love it is that I do think you see some of that sort of even though of course it's like a deeply tragic book yeah. you see some of that sort of tongue-in-cheek humor in it I have a question that we're at not I somebody just popped it into to the Q&A here I think it's probably of interest to the all everybody in the audience how do you balance both of you teaching and writing um because I know that's really difficult so thoughts or I don't have anything as personal to say about that, but I'd love to tell a Toni Morrison story that maybe Daniel could appreciate. <laughs> well, this took place at Fritzen. Toni gave a wonderful reading and there were like, you know, 500 people in the audience. And then there was questions and answers. And that, of course, could be fraught with some peril. So one person puts his hand up and it was a man. And he said, do you, do you foresee a time when you might write about something other than race? And it was like, is this the stupidest question we've ever heard in our lives? Tony, the look on Tony's face was just beautifully modulated. It sort of allowed everyone to know what she was thinking. And then she gave a very gracious answer. And I thought, that's, that's really class, you know? She just waited and she just allowed everybody to have a, their our own thoughts, but then she gave an answer that Sort of went over the head, I think, of the person who asked the question. I do wonder what the sort of people who come to events not to ask questions but to give speeches are doing with themselves these days, you know? Like, I feel like it's must be a very hard time for them. <laughs> oh, there used to always be that person in the audience who was clearly there waiting for the opportunity to deliver a thing that had nothing to do with what had been said. And like, where are they these days? But also to suggest sometimes the women to suggest to women that they should write about something else other than you know women's issues or or children or whatever to try to take from you something that's so important in your experience that's like your whole heart's been put into it as tony into her writing and to to dare to suggest that there be something else that she should be doing you know that would be like not race not race, race related i mean it was just such a an expression of such uh such hubris and blindness. Well, I hope he's not here on the queue, but go on. So we should finish up pretty soon, Diane. Yeah, we have a few other questions, but I think we're out of time. So I want to thank our guests who could join us tonight to welcome Danielle to the project. Uh, and it's been so wonderful being part of this conversation with Joe, Danielle, and Joyce. And we're really appreciative to co-host this with the Lafayette Library and Learning Center. It's been a pleasure working with Beth and Sarah. And we thank James Bell and Bell Investments for their support for our program tonight. And we're gonna hear another uh, little piece by the Piedmont East Bay Children's Choir uh, led by Eric Tuan. So please stay with us for a few more minutes to enjoy this last piece. And thank you again for joining us. I hope Thank you, you all so much.